Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning, I'd like us to return to the book of Romans and uh, consider a little further what I began last week in contemplating the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I titled the message this morning, Justification by Faith Alone. And if you're familiar with theology or church history, you know that that is... Uh, uh, that is a phrase that not only is found in Scripture, but is important in church history because it's the 500th anniversary of the Reformation here in, coming in October. And so I have a couple of pastor friends at local churches, and they are uh, we are talking about and planning on getting together at one of the churches to um, kind of celebrate and preach and um, talk about the Reformation. So at the end of October, just be aware of that. And so um, we're all going to be invited for a time of fellowship and to hear some uh, preaching so that we can fully understand the heritage that we have, this wonderful um, understanding of Scripture that was not discovered but recovered about 500 years ago. Of course, we're not preaching on the Reformation per se, but history is important, and we want to take our teaching from Scripture and from uh, the inspired Word. And so this morning I want to talk about justification by faith alone, and I'm going to get more theological somewhere down the road. I will have to come back to this at some point so that we can dig into the history and understand the differences, for example, between uh, Protestantism and Roman Catholicism and things like that. Those are important things to understand. But for this morning, I'd like it to be a little bit more devotional as we consider justification by faith alone. And just stop and ask you the question, who do you thank for your salvation? What is the dominating characteristic of a genuine Christian? How did God save you and what role does faith play? How does faith work and what role does works play? What proof can you offer that your faith is genuine? I'm asking these questions of myself as well. If we are saved by grace and not by works, do we ever entertain the idea that it's okay to sin because we can just ask for forgiveness later? Don't judge me. I know you do it too. Or the thought enters into our mind. If God is all forgiving and all loving, then he'll just, it's okay. Because I am free in Christ, am I free to live any way I want? I think these are some of the questions and some of the, the concepts that Paul is dealing with, particularly in verses 27 through 31, where we'll concentrate our time this morning. Up to this point in Romans, Paul has made the case that every person's situation is dire. Every person is at one point in their life um, has failed to honor God and thank Him for being our great creator, sustainer, redeemer. And, and because of our rebellion, Romans 1 declares the wrath of God is against all unrighteousness and ungodliness. We can't solve our own problem of sin. And so we spoke about the cross, the glorious cross last week. It's great news, wonderful news, the best news that anyone could ever hear. There is no one righteous, no, not one, we learned last week. No one understands, no one seeks for God. I, I call this in an earlier message, the universality of sin. And because sin is universal, death is universal, both spiritually and physically. We, we know that. A sin entered into the world. Our situation is bad. Apart from Christ, we are without God and without hope in the world. That's the argument that Paul is building. And in verse 21, he takes a turn from the bad news to the good news. And he gives the solution to every person's situation. And that solution is God's grace. God's righteousness at Christ's expense. We read in verse 23 of chapter 3, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so we talk much about this term justification. I certainly hope you don't get tired of it between now and the end of October when we finally celebrate this, the Reformation 500 years. The justification is important. It's a legal term that, that means to be counted righteous, to be declared righteous. It's a verdict, if you will. It's, it's a legal term that God uses, and this verdict comes down and includes many things. Not only the pardon from all guilt and penalty of sin, but the important word here, imputation of Christ's righteousness to the believer's account which provides for the, another fancy term, positive righteousness that every man must possess in order to be seen righteous before God. 
As I said last week, it's not enough just to be declared not guilty or to be treated as if you've never sinned. There's the positive side of that where we have to have lived the perfect life and fulfilled all requirements of the law to fulfill all righteousness. And we have learned through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that that righteousness, that positive righteousness is imputed, is given to us by faith. We're justified as a grace, a gift of grace. God, God declares the sinner righteous solely on the basis of the merits of Christ's righteousness. So, my question remains, who do you thank for your salvation? What should be the dominating characteristic of a person who is saved by grace? We give all praise and glory to God for our salvation. Nobody thanks themselves for their salvation Nobody is puffed up in terms of thinking that they did something wonderful in terms of their salvation. And the genuine mark of the Christian who is truly saved, truly justified as a gift, is humility. And we're going to see that in the passage. It is actually hard for me as I study uh, different beliefs, um, also studying the Reformation, studying uh, the arguments that Paul is bringing forth here. In fact, he's anticipating arguments against his case for justification by faith. And it's hard to believe that anyone would argue that we are saved by anything other than grace. But Paul knows there are those in his audience that recoil at this teaching and boast in themselves their religion, their heritage. And the apostle knows his detractors well, and he anticipates their objection. It is hard for me to fathom that there are individuals who, by the testimony of Scripture and by the testimony of their own life, think that they can somehow merit God's favor through their works. But yet there are still systems out there that believe in that. And so Paul's going to assert three truths regarding justification by faith. We'll look at them in verses 27 to 31. I can only cover two of them today. Number one, justification by faith alone excludes all boasting. Number two, justification by faith alone is the only way of salvation. Number three, justification by faith alone upholds God's laws. In other words, just because we're saved by grace and we're justified as a gift, does the law no longer have any bearing? And what use was there of the law to begin with? And by the way, can we just do whatever we want? And we know Paul's going to deal with that later in Romans 3. He's going to deal with that earlier here in Romans 4. So, number one, justification alone excludes all boasting. If there's one thing that I would like to root out of my life above every other sin that is, let's use the term, life-dominating. We have, we have this saying, life-dominating sins. All sin is life-dominating. It's destroying of life. But the one dominating sin I would like to root out of my life would be pride. Pride. It's the sin that we're least likely to admit. Why? Because we're prideful. And uh, it is the sin that we disdain the most in others, but rarely see in ourselves, the sin of pride. And so Paul begins, and he addresses this whole issue of boasting. Now, after we've just extolled the virtues of the cross and the glorious redemption that is found in Christ alone, that his, shed, his blood was shed for us, and, and when you look at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, do you, do you find within yourself boasting welling? Do you? No. The cross, justification, God's grace in the gospel, it excludes boasting. It dissipates. It annihilates boasting, does it not? I mean, this is the effect that the cross should have in the life of the individual who is truly understanding their salvation is a free gift of redemption through the blood of Christ. And even those of us who love good theology or we like to revel in theology, we, of all people, should understand that we are to be the most humble, the most grateful, the most thankful. Paul says in verse 27, what then becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So he raises this issue of boasting. But remember, Paul's argument is mostly against the religious Jews who trusted in their own righteousness. If you think back to chapter 2, Paul says in verse 17, but if you call yourself a Jew and you rely on the law and boast in God, verse 23, you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. 
The very thing that they were boasting in and prideful of is the very thing that they violated. Remember Jesus and the Pharisees? Pharisees especially pride themselves in keeping the law. They fasted, they prayed at required times, they observed uh, the requirement of the Sabbath, they, they tithed their mints and all their table spices right down to the, to the minutia. They did all the prescribed rituals, they carefully washed themselves, and Jesus confronted them time and time again for their hypocrisy, for the heart attitude that was behind all their external behavior. Their boasting was not good. And Paul knows that these individuals who have this objection are hypocrites. So, he's going to point it out. He's going to bring it out. And he's going to kind of elaborate on it in chapter 4. He's going to use Abraham as an example. Chapter 4, verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. You see, Paul's just bringing this argument to bear. And really, you think about, I don't know, you think about the the arrogant Christian, the prideful Christian, you know, the, those who are triumphal, like they did something special in order to be seen as God's people. Because I carry the right Bible translation or because I'm in church and they're not in church, but I'm in church. I'm all, the doors are open. Whatever it is, this tendency to pride is innate in our nature and it remains in our fallen nature. And the tendency is to slip back into thinking that we did something that would just elicit God's favor. He would just, look, surely I mean, he's going to look upon me. But if you don't believe you're the least likely person to be saved in this room, then you need to examine yourself once again. Apostle knows that his audience is uh, well versed to this pride because he also was one who boasted in his religious credentials and his good works and, and so was I before Christ. In Philippians 3, 3 he states that if anyone had reason to put confidence in the flesh it would have been him. And having been saved by grace Paul could look back and he said all the things that I placed my confidence in all the things that I was trusting in in order to find favor with God are things that actually became a hindrance to knowing Christ my good education, my heritage, the best schools, uh, the best teaching, my, my religious zeal, all these things, ceremony, ritual, whatever it is, those are the things that Paul thought were, were earning favor with God. They actually became a stumbling block. And he says he counted all his religious achievements as garbage in order to gain Christ. Those things aren't bad. Religious upbringing. We want, our, we want to raise our children in Christian homes. It's not bad to go to a Christian school. It's not bad to be zealous for religion. But if you're counting on those things, then you're not counting Christ as your greatest gain. And Paul says in verse 9 of Philippians 3, he wanted to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. There's that theme again. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. He just keeps undermining this time and time again. And I think there's some, some instance where Paul even talks about himself as saying, I was an ignorant blasphemer, I was this, I was this, I was this, but God showed me mercy. It's a reminder to those who are listening, but also a reminder to himself that there is nothing that he has done to achieve salvation or merit God's favor. There's no work. And he just hammers this truth home of justification by faith alone. Because listen, it undermines our, it underscores our human inability. It just shows us what we read in chapter 3. There's no one righteous. There's no one seeks after God. They've all turned aside. It shows us of our inability and it undermines our pride. And our pride needs to be undermined. God knows we need help with this because our hearts are inclined towards pride. We want to take some credit for our salvation and it's our nature to boast in ourselves. And so that's why Paul reminds the believers at Corinth, those believers who are prideful and boasting in these spiritual gifts and looking down on others, he reminds them and he reminds us as well. 1 Corinthians 1. He said, consider your calling. Now, if you came here this morning looking for your self-esteem to be bolstered, you might not want to read this verse. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble of noble birth. 
But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Why are the scriptures so adamant against boasting? Because pride is the root of all sin. Because of pride, Satan fell. Adam disobeyed and sin entered the world. And this whole idea that we are somehow good enough to merit God's favor, well, as one commentator said, the greatest lie in all the world and the lie common to all false religions and cults is that by certain works of their doing, men are able to make themselves acceptable to God. The greatest error in that belief is the sheer impossibility but the greatest evil of that belief is that it robs God of his glory. And that's no small thing. Brothers and sisters, we can't boast in our religious activity. We cannot boast, no matter how religious we look like. Look, on the outside, God looks at the heart. Now, Good things that we do, like attending worship, going to Bible study, going to church, getting baptized, taking the Lord's Supper, serving, etc., 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 all good things have nothing to do with our salvation. Hear this, they are all the outflow or the results of our salvation. They are all a response to the work of God in our lives that we do gather together and we do serve and we do give and we do acts of charity and kindness and acts of faith and share the gospel we can't boast in our knowledge of Scripture and doctrine. I love to study the Scripture and would that everyone in here would pick up their Bibles and take up God's Word daily and that we would be students of doctrine and Scripture. I encourage unbelievers to read Scripture, not because reading Scripture alone will make them acceptable to God, but that by reading Scripture they can come to the knowledge of Christ. They can hear the words of Christ and be saved. But it's not by our knowledge of Scripture and our doctrine. And get this, we can't even boast in our own faith. Now, I don't know what that would look like, but I think I've heard it from time to time. Now, I'm a man of faith. I have faith. I have, you know, my faith. My faith keeps me. My faith saves me. No, no, that's, no, I'm, I got faith. Your faith doesn't save you. Christ saves you. Faith is the instrument by which Christ's righteousness is applied to your life. We cannot take credit for believing in Jesus. I know this is controversial, but that is exactly what we do when we look at unbelievers with disdain because they don't believe and somehow we do. Somehow we're good enough and we're the people of God and we were smart enough to respond and have faith in the message that was preached. Mm -mm. The Bible is clear. Faith is not something that rises out of the unregenerate heart of man. Faith is something that is given as a gift by the sovereign working of the Holy Spirit as your heart is transformed, as the Spirit of God works in you and regenerates you. Faith is the natural response. It is a gift of God. I know it's controversial. Uh, some people think, well, you know what, uh, I believe in sin, I believe that, that we're tainted by sin, but I think there's just enough goodness in me, just a, a flicker of hope somewhere in my subconscious that allows me to respond to this message. No. No. Can't take credit for believing in Jesus. We boast in our faith as if we're somehow wise enough to believe the gospel. Faith is not something that comes out of the heart of the unbeliever. It's not something we muster on our own apart from the intervening work of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we would have reason to boast, wouldn't we? We would all get up here and we would boast about our faith. You have faith? I have faith. I have faith. It's clear from Scripture. I'll give you three quick verses. John 6, 65, where Jesus said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it just closes the door on this argument. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift from God. Your faith is not your own doing. It is a gift from God. 
and that is a result of works, so that what? No one may boast. And of course, in our passage, verse 24, we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, I know the arguments that are, well, then what place does works have to do with this? And we'll certainly take up those arguments, hopefully in the days to come. Uh, well, then how does faith work? And how do we exercise faith? And why would we even call people to faith if they have the no ability to do it? And I got an answer for that, but um, I did like all good pastors. I, I just did a search online. Where does faith come from? Where does faith come from? I want to read to you from a very good website called gotquestions.org. I recommend it to you. Read with discernment. Faith is the avenue or the instrument God uses to bring salvation to his people. God gives faith because of his grace and mercy. We just read Ephesians 2.8. Because he loves us, Ephesians 4 and 5, faith comes from God in the form of a gift. So if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today, then you've been given a gift. And a gift is not something you earned. It's not something you deserve. It's something that was given to you. It's not earned by some kind word or some deed. It, it is not your prayer that triggers the sovereign hand of God to regenerate your heart. It is the sovereign work of God that regenerates your heart and causes you to cry, Abba, Father. That's how it works. But we tell people, if you will say this prayer, then God will respond and he will save you. Listen, our words cannot trigger God's salvation. I used an example earlier in talking to one of the brothers this morning. We understand, right? Somebody kept, I don't know if it was Whitfield or something, they kept saying, why do you always tell people they need to be born again? Why do you always tell people they need to be born again? Because you must be born again. Jesus said so. And we use the example. When a baby is born, baby doesn't go, um, hello, I'd like to be born right now. I'd like to be born right now. Okay, the do call the doctor, get the anesthesiologist. We're going to bring forth this child. The same in the spiritual life. And Jesus uses the analogy of being born again. Babies cry once they're born. The, the cry of the baby is the natural response. I don't know if they do that anymore, but they usually like, you hear the baby cry, you know all is well. You, you know there's life, right? So being born again is a result of the sovereign work of God. that He causes our hearts to be born again. We come forward and we, we cry. We make noise with our mouth and we exercise faith. But make no mistake, it's not the faith that triggers it. The faith was the gift that's responsive to it. Now you may think, wow, that's quite a mystery. Well, it is a mystery. But it is what the scripture clearly teaches. The Bible emphasizes that faith is a gift because God deserves all the glory for our salvation. If the receiver of faith could do anything whatsoever to earn the gift, that person would have every right to boast. But all such boasting is excluded. God wants Christians to understand they have done nothing to earn faith. It's only because of what Christ has done on the cross that God gives anyone faith. Now the Bible specifies the way or the means that God gives faith to people. Faith comes from hearing the message. The message is heard through the word about Christ. It is the word of God that produces faith. Someone could receive faith while hearing a sermon, teaching the gospel, reading the scriptures about Jesus and the Bible. Faith is not the product of the preacher's compelling presentation, his eloquence, or even his theological soundness. Faith is given through the message of Jesus. Someone once said to me, you, if you would have just given the invitation, right, you had people right where you needed them and you didn't give the invitation by which Somehow they're not going to get saved because I didn't use the right words or the right mechanism or the right method. I don't believe in that. I believe that God is sovereign. But yet we call people to faith. God is imploring people to be reconciled to Christ as if God is making the appeal through us. And I urge you, be reconciled to Christ. I can't affect salvation in your life. I can't do it. I can't stamp you on the forehead saying, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved. But I can call you to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the sovereign spirit can quicken your heart. Right? I, I know that was a weird analogy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I would love to have you all sign on the dotted line that you're saved Christians. But I'm not the Holy Spirit. And I can't do the convicting work that only God can do. 
And I'll tell you, with that, I can sleep at night. Because no one is going to miss out on heaven because I fumbled through another bad sermon. As long as I preach Christ and Him crucified. Right? This, this message comes through Christ. And it is good for anyone who wants faith to ask for it. God freely gives what is good to all who ask, Luke 11. And it's good to ask for an increase in faith. And Jesus prayed for Peter's faith not to be strengthened. To be strengthened. And as with any gift from God, it's our responsibility to exercise the gift and not become complacent, lazy, or apathetic. But Christians can find comfort and peace of mind knowing that their faith is from God. What does Hebrews say? 12 verse 2. God is the author and perfecter of our faith. And he who began a good work will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And there's much to be said on faith. There's more to be said about our faith. But faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. And faith is something we need to study because faith, the word, has fallen on hard times. Faith can mean whatever you want it to mean. But as Jude said, we want to earnestly contend for the, the faith, definite article, the faith, once and for all delivered to the saints. That's what I'm preaching to you today. Salvation is all of God and all by grace. Justification by faith alone excludes all human boasting. Number two, justification by faith alone is the only way of salvation. Romans 29, 30. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. It would seem that Paul is still focused on those religious Jews who believe that they are unique and special in God's plan of redemption. That they have a special place. And in fact, God has one plan for the Jews, but he has another plan for everybody else. Or some people think there is one way of salvation in the Old Testament, and there's a whole new way of salvation in the New Testament. But, but Paul is going to argue that salvation has, has always been by justification, uh, by faith alone, in Christ alone. It's always been by faith. He reminds them in their creed, right, where he says in verse 30, since God is one, their, their famous creed in Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord our God is one. If God is one, then he must not only be the God of the Jews, but the God of everyone else as well. And if God is one, Paul's making the argument, he must be the author of salvation for the Jews and the author of salvation for the Gentiles as well. There is only one way of salvation, it's through faith alone. And since we've shown, Paul says, that we are justified by faith in Christ apart from the works of the law, this must apply equally to both Jews and Gentiles. God justifies all people through faith. But again, the tendency of religious people is to justify themselves through their religion, through their rituals. And so he brings up this whole point of circumcision with them. And in case they're still thinking about it, he gets into chapter 4 and he brings up old Abraham, the father of Israel. And he says, prior to Abraham being obedient in any act of circumcision, he was justified by faith. Long before any act, any outward act, there is not one way of salvation for some people and another way for others. And so as we read articles that, well, the Reformation's over and it was really a bunch of squabbling about nothing, let me tell you something. The difference between Protestants and Roman Catholicism is one salvation for one and another way of salvation for another. I'll explain that more later, but there is not two ways to salvation. There is one way of salvation. It is by faith alone, not by works. It's always been that way ever since the fall. Read Hebrews 11, starting with Abel. And notice how many times God says over and over, by faith, by faith, by faith, Noah, by faith, Moses, by faith, by faith, Sarah, by faith, Abraham. It's always been salvation by faith alone. Justification by faith alone excludes all boasting. Justification by faith alone is the only way of salvation and maybe next time, justification by faith alone upholds God's law. Well, friends, the Lord's table is a reminder to us that God sent His one and only Son to the cross to die as our substitute for our justification. He was raised on the third day. 
Christ alone is the penalty for, for our sins. And the attitude by which we would come to the table would be a repentant attitude, a confessing attitude, a very grateful attitude, joyful attitude, but humility, humility. You're wondering, okay, the implications of the Reformation go far beyond just the way we view Scripture. That was one of the, sola scriptura, that's one of the biggest. Is the scripture alone the sole, uh, the sole authority for life and practice, or is it the scripture and, and the church? And does the church usurp scripture? We believe in scripture alone. We believe the church submits to scripture. And in submitting to scripture, that's where we get our doctrine of sola fide, that faith alone. And all the other implications are going to flow from that, because once we land the plumb line on the authority of scripture, then we can take all our teachings and all our doctrines from Scripture. And the idea of transubstantiation, where a priest would ring a bell and this would turn into the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ, would never enter into our minds because they don't make the argument from Scripture. It's from man. Those are just some of the ideas that enter into Christianity. And this, my friends, is a memorial of Christ's death and His body and blood that was shed for us. As so we come to the table of the King. The attitude of true faith would be like that of the tax collector. So people have often asked me, hey, do I come, how do I come in a worthy manner? Well, in one sense, we're all unworthy to come to receive the Lord's Supper. We're all unworthy to receive salvation. But He makes us worthy and He deems us worthy. And so we no longer celebrate our unworthiness, but we celebrate Christ's righteousness. And we say, oh, here's how I come to the table. I come by faith in Christ. I know that I, I bombed out at some point this week. I know that I made a hash of certain things and I've sinned this week, so I'm not perfect. But we come in Christ, pleading His blood and His righteousness. He makes us acceptable. And by the very means of taking the bread and the cup in your hand, you're saying, I believe Jesus died for my sins. That's a prerequisite for it. I'm not one to keep you from the table, but I'm one to encourage you that if you've placed your faith alone in Christ alone, and you're trusting in Him for your life and your death, and you're totally believing this, and this is your way, you want to uphold the gospel, you want to proclaim the gospel, and you see evidences of genuine salvation in your life, evidences like love for God, repentance of sin and hatred of sin, evidence like a devotion to God's glory, genuine humility, prayer, selfless love for God and others, separation from the world. It's like you don't really love the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're passing through. You, you understand the idea where we're not living as cloistered people away from the world world, but do you see spiritual growth in your life? Do you have an appetite or a hunger? I was, I was, uh, there was a pastor recently who was just kind of lamenting the appetite of God's people because as we gather together for the word, we're just, where are the people? Where are, where are those who profess faith in Christ on any given Sunday? Question is, what is their appetite like? They're not hungering for righteousness, hungering for his word? Do you possess obedient living? This is not a rules of do's or don'ts. By the way, this is what happens in your life when you trust Christ. Not instantaneous, but transformation. Is your life changed because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you possess a transformed life? If those things are evident, then you're invited to the table. If you're still questioning the claims of Christ or you're not sure... Let it, let it go by. There's no harm in that. Nobody's going to look at you and judge you for it. Examine your life to see whether you're in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. So I'm going to ask the men to come forward to pass out the bread and cup. I'll ask them to come forward now. And uh, I'm going to ask Tim Funk to pray when he comes forward. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass out the elements the bread in the cup and we're going to wait for further instruction but in this time rejoice be thankful be confessing whatever the Lord would have you do to prepare your hearts for this is there some area in your life where you are struggling with sin confess it and ask for the cleansing of, of the cross 
and we're going to ask uh, Brother Tim to pray for the cup now. And so we're going to take it together and wait for further instruction as I'll lead us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, we can gather here together in your house. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful picture of being able to take these elements today to picture your death and your resurrection. Lord, we can't thank you enough for that. And Lord, as we do have a chance for the plate to come by and we pick up the cup and the bread, if Lord, there are people in here that, that don't understand that or don't feel that it's time for them to take that or they have things that are compounding in their life that make it difficult for them to take this cup, let it pass by them, Lord, and have them not be ashamed of that, that they have conviction and they need to be right with you in all that they do. Well, Lord, we, we just can't thank you enough for this beautiful picture. Help us, Lord, to, again, just be mindful of what we're doing. And as we have it, take this cup and element, help us, Lord, to take the words that are spoken as we do take it, apply it to our lives, and cleanse us, Lord, and remember you in all that we say and do. We give you the praise and the glory in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
throughout the next few weeks and months, I hope to give you points of distinction that are relevant to the Reformation. And one of them, obviously, is the Lord's Supper. Um, we do not teach that uh, God's grace is imparted or infused to us through these elements, for they are just mere pictures. I actually went to IGA to get the Jews this morning. There's nothing mystical, there's nothing magical, but they are pictures. And they are symbolic, as we'll read from Scripture. As opposed to Roman Catholicism, which would teach that this becomes the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ, whereby we take it inward, and then His grace and His merit is imparted to us, and we become righteous in and of ourselves. It's called infused righteousness, which would be different than imputed righteousness. So I don't want you to get the idea that this is a, this is a, a work. That's what I'm trying to say. This is not a work where other systems believe that this is a work. The more you do this, the more righteous you become. The scripture doesn't tell us how often to do it, but Jesus just says, do, do it in remembrance. Okay? And so there is an important point of distinction because we are remembering that his death was sufficient and that he is coming again. Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in, here's the word, remembrance of me. Let's do this together in remembrance of Christ's death for us. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's do this together. Let's go to the Lord in one final prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this picture that you have given us, the church. A visible representation, a visible display of the gospel. Father, that even a child can understand what it means to uh, do this in remembrance. It's a memorial, Father. But even so, in our act of obedience, we thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you bless us for our obedience, and we thank you for your participation with us. But most of all, we thank you that you have deemed us not worthy in and of ourselves, but because of your infinite love, you have deemed us worthy to become the children of God. So we thank you in your infinite love, Father, that you have saved us, you have sent your Son to die for our sins, and we thank you that he is coming again with power and glory. And as we leave here, Father, I pray that we would proclaim this message until that day he does descend in the clouds. For Jesus' sake I pray, amen. Thank you for being here today and for participating. We are dismissed.